this is art one, and we're coming to find a focus. There are two artists that we're going to use, with a third artist placed as a kind of a median in between the two. The two artists are Max Ernst and Wasley Kandinsky, and the third artist that's going to go in between is Georgia O'Keeffe. Now there's no, there's no book on Georgia O'Keeffe that really does it. She supervised a large studio book towards the end of her life, published by uh, Viking Studio Books about 20 years ago. But this video is a beautiful um, presentation of Georgia O'Keeffe, and you can find this around in various rental libraries. I think they even sell it here at the Bodhi Tree. Georgia O'Keeffe will be a kind of a background barometer. She lives up into what we would call current time. She lived to be 90-something, and uh, she lived right up until just recent years. Max Ernst died in 1976 at 85. Kandinsky died in 1944, and uh, he was in his mature years. It would be better to use an artist like Rembrandt rather than Kandinsky, and perhaps in the millennial countdown cycle of this course, I'll use Rembrandt and Max Ernst rather than Kandinsky and Ernst. But we'll use Kandinsky now. I've used him uh, six different times, six different cycles of this. Kandinsky is extremely important. He is the genius behind the development of abstract art in the 20th century. You can look at the development of, say, for instance, an art movement like Cubism, and one says, well, it's Picasso and Brock with Juan Gray. But before them, it's Cezanne. But when you look at Cezanne, you don't see abstraction so much as you see a structuralist insight. In a way, Cezanne is very much like a Claude Levi Strauss in anthropology. He's able to train his sight to see in a visionary way so that Cezanne's visionary sight sees the structural planes that underlie form. And so cubism is rather a very superficial development of something that is profound in Cezanne. But none of that movement is abstract. Whereas Kandinsky is truly abstract. Abstract meaning that Kandinsky leaves nature behind totally. In the 1940s, 1950s, the kind of aesthetic language that was used for abstract art is that it was non-representational. Whereas this is not true at all. Or sometimes they would say it's non-objective, but that's not true at all. A Kandinsky painting is as objective as anyone's painting. It's as representational as any kind of artistic production that one would look for. But what it is, truly, is abstract. And this whole process of abstraction gives to Kandinsky um, one of the rarest places in human development. The only thing to compare with Kandinsky's development of abstraction is the origins of art in Paleolithic times. And in fact, it's going back to the conditions of Paleolithic humanity that Kandinsky was able to go back and reach and touch that kind of lodestone of transfiguration that allowed him to bring out a completely new form the only figure at the time who was really conversant with Kandinsky. He had a very close friend in Paul Clay, and Clay finally came to understand because of his great sympathy. 
and his great art artistry. But the only intellectual peer that Kandinsky had was the composer Schoenberg. And Schoenberg and Kandinsky wrote letters to each other, which are published, and there's a book out in, in paperback. And it was Schoenberg who understood that Kandinsky's abstraction of color and form out of nature completely was something capable of being done in terms of music. And Schoenberg's 12-tone scale music is the world's first truly abstract music. One little insight behind this. Schoenberg and Kandinsky realized that all of the scales of human valuation were arbitrary. The valuation that comes out of the way in which we see or hear or taste, all of the calibrations of sense perception, which become framed in valuation spectrums, are totally arbitrary. They have no basis whatsoever in any kind of concrete reality. It comes as a total shock to someone conscious to realize that the entire development of sentient life in our species is all based upon arbitrariness, chance, habit, conditioning, preference, and non-reality. So that Kandinsky and Schoenberg were two of the very first human beings to understand that because all calibration spectrums are arbitrary, one can substitute any particular spectrum, as long as it's self-consistent, for the one in which one traditionally worked. Not only, for instance, is there a 12-tone musical scale like Schoenberg developed, but in actual fact there are an infinite number of musical scales. There is no limit to the musical scales that are possible in reality. In other words, there is a music for millions and millions of musical scales that has never been heard or written that is totally possible. The discovery of this for Kandinsky, even more than Schoenberg, was like a blast on his psyche it was a complete explosion of what was possible and a total reassessment then of what the person was. A total reassessment of what the mind was and a complete reassessment of what the body was. So all objectivity, all of the stages and phases of objectivity in the universe for Kandinsky Existence itself, as objectified by bodies, the very stuff of things. Existence itself was problematical. Not problematical in terms of some philosophic question which one would ask vis-a-vis -vis those things, but that the things themselves in their actuality were structurally problematical. You didn't have to ask any kind of philosophic question whatsoever. They were already, in reality, problematical. That is, that existence is an arbitrary, though highly objective, manifestation in the real. This was devastating to Kandinsky. But being somewhat of a giant in terms of acceptance of new conceptions, somewhat of a titan in the way in which he allowed perception to have new possibilities, he was able to absorb that existence was problematical structurally. But it was quite another order to realize that the mind also is structurally, in its nature, problematical in terms of the real. This was extremely upsetting to him. And as he matured, 
as he left his native Russia and went in search of some place where artistically he could implode, he finally found it in the southern Bavarian German city of Munich. And in Munich, Kandinsky came into contact with a number of artists, Franz Marc among them. He came into contact with a movement of artistic development in Germany at that time that was beginning to feel its way into what they would call at that time the incomprehensible. The development in Germany at that time was an art movement that was beginning and it was called Dada. And the genius of Dada was Max Ernst, our other artist. Kandinsky found in the Munich, before the First World War, the perfect anvil upon which to hammer away the last vestiges of confidence that at least the mind had an ability to shape itself which was certain and real in the universe. And as he pounded away the last vestiges of what the mind could hold, he discovered a rush of metaphysical joy within himself that was truly incomprehensible. He didn't know what to make out of it. Gabriel Munter, his lady friend who shared his life at the time, records in her paintings that Kandinsky, who had always favored the kind of fairy tale folklore of the peasant Russians, in his iconography. His images were always back to knights on horses and damsels in beautiful flowing gowns and forests of scintillating leaves and these natural and folklore and fairy tale images slowly disappeared into a rain of splotches of color that look very much like Seurat's work of an impressionistic version of Seurat. But out of this emerged a kind of a white out, a white out of all natural reference, and in its place, instead of the white out just blanking out, just assuming a nondescript nothingness, out of that nothingness came slashes of color like exclamation marks in the spectrum of vibrant color and light. The very first beginnings of an abstract painting were a transfiguration of a horse and rider into just slashes of color that somewhat resembled a Paleolithic cave painting of a horse and a rider, except that in Paleolithic cave paintings one would never find man riding a horse. But at the beginning of abstract art, you found this kind of quality. Kandinsky found the same thing that Max Ernst found. He found that when you let go of the body, when you let go of the mind, structurally, not just let go of its preferences, not just unshackle the habits, but let it go. that that nothingness that remains, that blank starkness that remains is fertile. And out of it mysteriously comes another nature, a nature which has for itself a dimension of consciousness, of self-consciousness to the point of having an ironical, paradoxical, humorous take on everything in time space. But where Kandinsky came to it as a mature man, he was in his 40s when he came to it. Max Ernst came to it as a little child. So let's shift over to Max Ernst for a minute. Max Ernst was born in 1891. 
he said in the chronology of his life that his first works of art were stains on diapers. He's <laughs> <laughs> a character. Max Ernst's father was an amateur painter. Ernst never had any art lessons in his life except that he watched his father work. And in the mysterious way that a creative little boy will surreptitiously watch what the dad does, not what he says, or what he says you should know, but watch what he does. Ernst got the little gestures of how to hold a brush, of how to hold a piece of chalk. And just out of playing with that as a boy, he came into being an artist. The earliest painting that still survives of Max Ernst, I'll bring a slide next week, is a painting that has large splotches of yellow and green and a kind of a red circle that emerges somewhere near the top of the canvas, done I think when he was still a teenager. <clears throat> that painting presages the archetypal development of Max Ernst's whole life. All of his 85 years of art are there in that seed. Though he wouldn't understand it, he wouldn't know it for another almost 20 years. But his father was an amateur painter, not a regular painter. The father's job was in teaching the deaf. So that in teaching the deaf, Max Ernst grew up in a household where signing with the hand was like a normal occurrence. And so the hand for Ernst was always magical. The hand conveyed a language which the eye picked up. So that the eye read the hand and bypassed the whole habitual syndrome of a spoken language or a written language. Understand this, Max Ernst was a wild mystical genius who as a little boy lived in an environment where language was not spoken or written but was signed with hands. So that he grew up understanding there were many ways to communicate that language is protean and doesn't develop at all necessarily on the way in which one says something or in which the one writes something, but that the hand and the eye together can bypass entirely the whole mythic and symbolic structure. The person who is deaf, who cannot hear, does not participate in that classic mythic level of life at all. And because they do not depend fundamentally upon myth, upon spoken language, they do not automatically come to written language, the symbolic. So if the person who is congenitally deaf comes upon language, bypassing the mythic, and largely seeing the symbolic as one example of the possibility but that the primary focus is upon the spiritual person being able to coordinate hand and eye, and that that's where the language is. That the creative gestalt of the person is where the objectivity of signing language registers. And so Max Ernst, from little tiny boy, already understood, he lived, he was familiar with, that kind of world where the mythic level of spoken experience and the symbolic level of written mentality were dispensable. You could have them if you wanted, you didn't need them. You could go directly to something else. But that something else, that signing of the hands with the eye, that whole process is not yet art. That whole process is what we are calling vision. It's what was traditionally called magic. It's the realm of the supernatural. It's the realm above nature. 
A spoken language is still natural. Thought symbols are still natural. It's all within the purview of nature. But to coordinate hand and eye, to make a signing language, transcends both those realms and goes directly to the visionary. So Max Ernst, as a little tiny mystical visionary genius, lived in a realm where he could see that the visionary language was always operative. Now one more thing. Max Ernst is a little mystical genius was hit twice in his life by the death, death of a sister and the death of a pet bird. The first time he was six years old when his dying older sister Maria gave him one last hug and in that hug she perished. And the little six-year-old Max Ernst experienced, he said, true nothingness. His favorite older sister who had been there exactly poignantly in that moment of hugging him with joy at the end of the hug was dead and gone forever. She left a hole exactly there where she had been. And for the mystical little boy genius, Max Ernst said later in his autobiography, he said he experienced the blank nothingness that was real. A few years later, his favorite pet bird, a kind of a pinkish cockatoo that was a very close friend to him, died. And as that bird died, exactly at that moment, the birth of a new sister was announced from another room. And the little mystical boy, Max Ernst, suddenly had that blank nothingness filled with an exclamation mark of discovery that the soul of the bird had gone and become an, another sister. And he said, constantly after that, the confusion of birds and people on the spiritual level was real in him. He was certain of it. Because only something that was totally accurately real could have filled that nothingness that was so poignantly real for him at six years of age. Later in his life, in his mid-30s, during a crisis, Ernst would find the bird which was really him that came out of himself and declared itself as the true artist that inhabited the man, Max Ernst. They called that bird Lop Lop. And Lop Lop became the artistic reality, the objective artistic person who inhabited Max Ernst. And as Max Ernst grew and became his own person, his own artist, instead of displacing Lop Lop, Lop Lop was forced up into another level of objectivity. As Max Ernst, the man, became his own person, Lop Lop, the spiritual artist manifestation, was forced into a celestial realm of objectivity and became a part of the cosmos. And so Max Ernst, by the late 1920s, had discovered something which the 20th century is going to always be famous for. That to the extent that our spiritual person is real, to that extent, the cosmos itself is also real. That they're correlative. Uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, in his theory of poetry, called it objective correlative. That the objective correlative of the past was always that your symbols had to be linked to existent things, things that came out of nature that were real. And the symbols of the past were powerful because they were linked correlatively to existence, which was real. 
But Marx Ernst is the flip side of it, totally on the other side. Instead of being in the integral cycle of nature, where existence and symbol are together correlative, Ernst was in the differential consciousness, where the dis differential forms of open possibility were what were real. Nature, nature's reality and existence and mind were only provisional. Whereas the gestalt of the infinite possibility of the objective person, correlative with the gestalt of the infinite possibility of the cosmos, they were correlatively real. They were objective together. And to that extent, Ernst was convinced that man makes the celestial realms real. That their reality is a resonance of our reality and that man is responsible for making the cosmos real. The universe is a gift of nature, but the cosmos is a creative artistry of man, and that's why God depends upon man to exercise his share of creation, his responsibility. For only when man is real is the celestial realm of the heavens real. That in terms of nature, the universe itself is neutral. It has no valuation. It has no real calibration of valuation whatsoever. It's not just that the universe is ambivalent or rewards evil rather than good, but that the universe on natural is totally neutral. It has no valuation which it prefers whatsoever. Whereas the cosmos on the other side holds every valuation that's possible as long as it's held by someone who is spiritually real. And so heaven is the actual panoply of harmonies that are sung by real spiritual beings, ourselves, in our maturity. So the difference between universe and cosmos is almost 180 degrees, where the beginnings is just the blank rocks of total, ultimate, utter neutrality. The cosmos is a song, is a flower of all the valuations brought together into some kind of a consonance. Ernst tried to develop himself in a very gentle, beautiful, mystical way up until 1914, up until he was 23 years of age, and then he died. He says in his autobiography that Max Ernst died. He died on August 1st, 1914, because that's when he was lifted out of his world and thrown into the trenches of World War I as a common soldier, as an infantryman. And he was held pinned down there in the horrific trenches of World War I for year after year after year. He saw everything that human beings valued simply ground up and thrown away a torrential dissolving, a reign of terror that left nothing intact. And he wrote that when he and the few who had survived came back from that, when they woke up after being numbed so long by this maniacal death and destruction of young men on both sides, that what came up was not grief or nothingness, but pure anger. An anger against a civilization that would do this to young men by the millions. As he wrote, of what value was civilization to us? And out of that anger, out of that desperateness, not to find something, 
but to discover other things. Not to find a thing which was already there, but to uncover thingnesses that were not there. And so the whole slant after 1919 was towards creating a completely new world. A new world that could be created because by 1919, the development of the capacity for an abstract humanity was in place. As we began today talking about Kandinsky and Schoenberg. Because by 1919, early 1920, Kandinsky, Schoenberg, Paul Klee already had put into place, not only theoretically, beautifully, intellectually stated, but had put it into a body of art, into music and painting that would never go away, will never go away. It was there, and Ernst was exposed to this. The implosion of Max Ernst, this mystical little boy who would replace the nothingness with the interchangeableness of his bird and his young new sister, all of this tremendous fire, a fire which at the time, I think one of the musical pieces that you might listen to is um, uh, trans figuration of the night by uh, Schoenberg. It's the last time where one can hear a traditional melodic structure just before Schoenberg's compositions go 12 tone completely. Transfigur uh, transfigured night. The last of Kandinsky's paintings where one can still see the last vestiges of an integrative nature before he went totally abstract differential. One can still see in one of the last paintings a horseman riding, and as he rides, he dissolves into vectors of color, splotches of a spectrum. And Kandinsky writes this kind of language. This is from uh, Concerning the Spiritual and Art. written in 1913, just before the First World War started. Inner necessity is the basis of both small and great problems in painting. Today, we are seeking the road which is to lead us away from the external to the internal basis. In other words, we're turning our back on the external, on the integrative, on the natural. And we're facing the internal. We're facing the differential, the possible. The spirit, writes Kandinsky, the spirit, like the body, can be strengthened and developed by frequent exercise. So that there are spiritual exercises. There are calisthenics of the person. What are they? If these exercises are neglected, the spirit grows weak and finally impotent. The spirit, if untended, perishes. The innate feeling of the artist is that biblical talent which must not be buried in the earth. And for this reason, it is necessary for the artist to know the starting point for the exercise of his spirit. On what basis does the spirit stand to begin its exercises to build its strength so that it can mature itself? Kandinsky writes, the starting point is the study of color and its effects on men. Color. Why color? Before 
the abstract process in art of the 20th century. There was a presage of the abstract process before that, but it appeared only in mathematics. And the figure who was there at the very genesis of the appearance of the abstract for the first time in human history in mathematics was Sir Isaac Newton. And when Newton worked out the mathematics of abstraction in the 1680s, published it in 1687, he called it Principia Mathematica, the principles of mathematics. And it completely shifted the foundations of thought for all time. It showed that what was certain before then in mathematics was highly fluid and subject to changes which could be calculated to infinite detail. So that the development in Principia Mathematica of Sir Isaac Newton's calculus showed a way of expressing in mathematics the infinite details of change which nature actually has. That there's nothing static in nature whatsoever. It's all a matrix of change. And that matrix of change can be measured mathematically to every little nuance and iota. Uh, Newton didn't call it change so much. He used a mathematical term that uh, was in the physics of his time, of the 17th century. He called them fluxions. But what he meant by fluxions was not the chance fluxions that man had always meant when he said nature is full of change, it's always changing. He meant the mathematical formula that objectified exactly what those fluxions were, nanosecond by nanosecond. He developed a mathematical language that could talk precisely and exactly and shift and change as nature shift and changed and say it exactly to any degree of specificity one wanted. It took a couple of hundred years for that to settle in, for that to come in to 20th century art with Kandinsky and Schoenberg and Max Ernst. So when Newton looked at the mystical fluxions of nature and saw that consciousness was able to not only follow it in all of its permutations, but that consciousness could look ahead and tell what kind of changes were going to come out of a given direction. That nature is very peculiar. That once a given direction is started, it's always going to follow that trajectory unless interfered with. And that the mathematics that he developed showed that you could predict where it was going to go and it would go exactly there. You could not only follow all the changes in nature that were happening, but you could follow all the changes that had already happened and also those changes that were to happen were to come. In other words, man was given a mathematical language to predict exactly how nature was going to work under any given conditions whatsoever. that there was no more mystery whatsoever in nature. And young Newton, like young Max Ernst, was absolutely triumphant when he was able to do this, and then something happened that completely upset him. Like it upset Ernst, like it upset Kandinsky in his 40s. Because out of that blank nothingness that comes once you have it all certain and down and tied all by itself, the present unwraps and opens up and something completely different begins to happen. For Newton, it was so mysterious that he devoted the rest of his life, 30-some years, to trying to figure out what happens in the alchemy of theological history. 
He examined the book of Daniel and the book of the Apocalypse of St. John for the last 30 some years of his life, trying to figure out, to apply his calculus, his mathematics of universal fluxions to the mysteries of the way in which nature moves. He wrote a huge book on Daniel and the Apocalypse. I have a translation in uh, my library. He never figured it out. Too difficult. Someone like Kandinsky, someone like Ernst, in the early 1920s, when they were working with this, they found a clue which Newton did not have. Newton was trying to figure out the mathematics of differential conscious history in terms of looking at the past, in terms of trying to predict the future in terms of a present. Because you have to have a given in order to make calculus work. You can't predict on the basis of nothing, whereas Ernst and Kandinsky found in the early 20th century that spiritual man doesn't have to have anything to work with. That he can begin just by the activity of his beginningness. And out of this will come whatever he directs, a kind of a creative quality that has a resonance of the divine to it. For Kandinsky, because he was in his 40s, he looked back at the same material that Newton had looked at to see what he had missed. Newton had looked at the occult tradition of the West. He'd looked at the alchemical, Rosicrucian, metaphysical, occult tradition of the West. Newton was an alchemist. So Kandinsky looked at the same material and he saw that the alchemical occult tradition of the West had come to some kind of a formation, some kind of a fruition in the late 19th century, in the late 1800s, had come into some kind of a large systematic bow tied by Madame Blavatsky in the Theosophical Society. So Kandinsky, with his abstract artistic genius, looked at the factuality of the theosophical cosmos as presented by Madame Blavatsky's secret doctrine. And he saw in there aspects which had not been handled. Not that they hadn't been handled right, they hadn't been handled at all because they were not handleable. Because when one abstracts away from nature, one no longer has the body as a parallel, as a correlative. One no longer has the mind as a correlative, as a parallel. There is no traditional metaphysics whatsoever in the West that deals with no body, no mind, no correlatives. The only place that developed the other side, the obverse of that, was in the ancient East. And the ancient East developed a no body, no mind, non-metaphysics artistry. When Max Ernst, in 1924, realized that there was something he had to investigate, he teamed up with the surrealist poet Paul Eluard and his wife Gala, who later became Mrs. Solidar Dalin. And Gala and Paul Eluard and Max Ernst went to Saigon. They were living in Paris at the time, and the French were there in Vietnam. And so he went to Saigon. And there tried to search out and to find some way in which he could bring an insight from the East into play, into this artistic development. And when he came back for several months, he lay fallow, and then he was laying in his bed one August afternoon, 1925, and suddenly he remembered something as a little boy. <laughs> 
He remembered something from the time in between the nothingness of the death of one of his sisters and the rise of the spirit of the bird and the birth of another sister that in those years he had often stared at the wood that was there in his bedroom the wood with the burls and the knots and the grains of wood. And suddenly he looked and he saw the same kind of burls and grains in his room. And in them, he began to see something completely new, not associative in terms of the body or the mind, but something that was only discoverable by his activity of playing with it that he had to become a creative artist in the moment of playing with it, and only then could he tease out what was there. And so he rushed with paper, plastered it on the grains of wood, and began rubbing, rubbing these forms, making the impress of the forms on the rubbings of the paper, and then putting these rubbings together. And out of this was born the technique known as frottage, frottage, rubbing. And he coupled frottage with a technique that he had been developing in the early 20s called collage, putting various images together to get an ironical, to get a paradoxical, to get a black humor take on life. And by pairing together the techniques of collage and frottage, Ernst discovered a completely new realm of art. And as he did so, one finds the development concomitantly in Kandinsky's work of almost a quantum jump, as they say today, in the capacity for abstract art. When you look at Kandinsky's work about the same time, it's almost as if some great divine wind sensing that man was ready for new adventures started to blow upon the possibilities of the world. And those few brave courageous, adventurous artists of the wide open spaces found that they could begin to navigate in ways in which no one had ever talked about, or at least they had not talked about in spoken or written language. But mankind had talked about it in a way in which the deaf always have signed to each other. Because in a way, when one looks at Paleolithic art, one finds there the hand as the only self-symbol on a world of pictorial representations of the animals that surround the world. The hand is the symbol, but it's a transcendent symbol that's there. We'll come back after the break and we'll start right there and talk some more about art. In Kandinsky's Concerning the Spiritual and Art, the second part is about how to work with color, the psychological working with color. So when you're working on your painting, take a look at this and the language and form of color. For Kandinsky, he was intellectual enough curious enough, scientific enough, he wanted to know, well, just exactly how do you work with it? And so he experimented, he opened himself up, his, his mystical genius, his artistic discovery temperament showed him that blue and yellow move in opposite directions. It's not just that blue is cold and red is hot, but that they have movements and that yellow always has this kind of counterclockwise kind of motion so that you can have a dynamic play in a painting with your, your colors and your forms. He writes, Kandinsky writes, in the theoretical portion of Concerning the Spiritual and Art, he writes, because because of the very nature of modern structure, there has never been a time when it is more difficult than it is today to formulate a complete theory or to construct a pictorial foundation. 
Now, the reason that he's writing this, why he's saying that there never has been a time more difficult than today to formulate a complete theory, has a structural quality to it. He means to say it's not that the content is so difficult, but that the very structure of the mind is no longer there to record in the traditional ways. Try and hear it. The assumed structure of the mind that was operative for thousands of years is no longer there for us. Now one says, well, how can this be? Was it not there for those people way back when? And the answer is yes. So then the follow-up question is, well, if it was there for them, how can it not be there for us? Isn't the mind the mind? And the answer is yes. The mind is the mind. There is, in reality, no mind. The universe does not give us a structure called mind, labelable mind, which is permanent, irrevocable. It's only provisionally there as a modulation of indefinite change. All the elements are in flux, the entire structure is in flux. The possibilities of even structure are in flux. It's a complete delusion in the late 20th century to think that one could live truthfully on the basis of a past mind. It is simply not possible. It's not only an existential revulsion to try and live in some past way. It's not a theological doctrine that, well, you can't live in the past. It's a psychological, artistic penetration that the mind of the past is completely gone because it was only an arbitrary structure held in place as long as there was an objective correlative to the culture that went with it. And when that culture changed, when it dissolved, when it was smashed, when it was gone for many, many reasons, it, the mind was no longer there. Not possible to resuscitate it. If someone invites you to a fine home and sits you in French salon chairs and has a harpsichord of the period and someone plays you a nice little Mozart uh, piece on the harpsichord, for that duration you can live in the 18th century. And as soon as the last note is sounded, that's it. You're in 1997 plus. And where is that? Where is the mind of 1997 plus? It wasn't there in the 1790s of Mozart. It wasn't even there in 1996. It's not going to be there in 1998. It's only here at this particular date in 1997, because we're here and operative with it. After that, everything has changed. The penetration of the truth is that space and time are interdimensional with consciousness. And as soon as consciousness is strong enough to be brought into play as a dimension, time and space modify themselves to include that conscious dimension. There's no way around it. One can distract oneself from this actuality 
But the distractions are only operative as long as you continue to force them. And even then, they tire very quickly. It's what Newton found out mathematically. You can characterize the real to any degree of specificity you want, and it is always evanescent, mystical, and in change. Its thereness is never simply and finally there, and that's it. Its thereness is always sliding, even in time-space dimensions, much less a five-dimensional conscious time-space continuum. So that artists like Ernst and Kandinsky are not bearers of esoteric tidings for just a few. They're people who have put their finger on a locus where supposedly someone had tied knots for all time, and they're not there. They were only there for the split second when they were tied, and they were not there a split second later. And that it was a total delusion to assume that they had had any permanency whatsoever. So in the time, just after the First World War, in seeking to try to find what kind of a language can one use anyway, there was a French philosopher named Henri Bergson who wrote a book called Creative Evolution. He said, you want to talk about the challenge of Darwin's evolution? How about this challenge, the challenge of creative evolution, of the way in which conscious time-space flows and is fluid permanently? Yes, it is filled with an energy. It's filled with an energy, he called it an elan. That elan is certainly real and certainly operative. But that elan never is, its quality is always emergent. So that in order to characterize it, he used a term which translates as stream of consciousness. One has to look at this stream of consciousness, and one can't just look at it, one has to participate in that stream of consciousness. If you're not whitewater rafting on the stream of consciousness, you're on the banks of delusion. <laughs> you're watching people who are really living going by, and they're going by at the speed of light. But if you're on that stream of consciousness and you're whitewater rafting, every present moment as it moves continues its reality. Now, in order for someone to, to speak Bergsonese, Marcel Proust did it the best of all. A la recherche de temps perdu. Remembrance of things past. A huge seven-part novel. And once you start reading it, even in the Scott Moncrief English translation, it absorbs you. You read Proust for one page, and you look up, and you see Proustianly. You see out of Proust's eyes. You see the way in which Proust's inner vision sees. And if you read the whole thing, a couple of times you would get it that through Proustian vision, the world of staticness is a complete delusion. And people who assume that you can just move props of static isness around and be safe are fooling themselves to the point of madness. They are crazy. It's an insanity. Where sanity and life are, are whitewater rafting in the stream of consciousness. And that's the only place to be. Now, someone like Ernst, when he came back from Saigon, when he got into the whole discovery that one not only could paint and put juxtaposition of strange images together, so that you had a kind of a data type thing. The early data was always photographs. 
And on the photographs, various other objects that would be cut out, say, from a magazine or painted on to the photograph. So that you built up this layer of disparate juxtaposed images, and then you took a final photograph of that so that it gave you a single um, frame, single two-dimensional frame. That that collage technique, coupled with the frottage, the rubbing, the rubbing of natural things like a leaf or the grain of wood or something like that, that when you brought all of these techniques together, what came out of it increasingly was a sense of inner vision that you could look at the world and instead of being baffled by a habitual lying deception of supposed staticness, which was insanely never there, one began to see a world that seethed with life and actuality. And because you were living in a real world that seethed with actuality, your body woke up. It woke up out of the anesthetized, mummified stupidity that it had been placed for who knows how long. Not only your body, but the entire bodies of other people. The whole culture, the whole history was like some mad man's scrapbook of falsified photographs that never were alive. Now that somehow was assumed that that was the history in which we belonged. It was never true. It could never be true. And so Ernst in the mid-1920s especially began to work with he finally came out of the collage photographs. He came out of the frottage rubbings. He returned back to painting, back to the central art, back to the inner visionary expression. And right away, the cusp between 1924 and 1925, Ernst came out with a fantastic painting, unbelievable painting. The painting is called Paris Dream, a reproduction here. Paris Dream. Up at the top, where you see a mottled white and blue, that's the sky. There is a tropical blue underneath the mottled white layer of paint clouds. And he's taken an iron comb and he has scraped away two thirds of a circle, leaving one third of a circle underneath, which is completely white, like some kind of negative imprint of a pyramid. And that negative uh, imprint of a pyramid that's left gratis of not scraping it away, completely frames and exactly frames a series of esoteric domiciles where man can live in a different way. Domiciles whose rounded towers look like a musical scale of nine notes. So early in 1925, Ernst suddenly was capable of expressing something that had eluded him all of his life, had eluded man since Paleolithic times. In Paleolithic times, the hunters had magically put their hand on the tapestry of the animals that made the real world in which they could live. The animals were the world of their nutrition, were the world of their clothes, were the world of their very life. And by putting the tapestry of all these animals there on the secret place of the earth, in the cave underneath, and then by wetting the hand with their colored breath. That's how you get an impress of a hand on the wall. You do it that way, or you put the hand, and then you blow, you spit the color over the hand and take it away, and it leaves a negative imprint of the hand. You have two different ways of putting the hand. You have the positive way, and you have the negative way. 
Both ways are okay for Paleolithic men because Paleolithic men and women had to be real to survive. They lived in a very precarious world. But there's never been a world more precarious than the late 20th century. Because our precariousness is not because there are beasts that are going to gobble us up, but because there are deceptions that pretend to such a degree of accuracy that we go down mad, insane, static ways to dead ends all the time. And the only way to live is to learn to not do that. Don't go that way. Because the world of deception is so complete now that it's like a tar baby. And as soon as you engage it anyway, by hitting at it or by ignoring it, it pulls you in both ways and incorporates you into this dead end. That the precariousness of our times is on this kind of a scale. And the only way to live the 21st century is to be real. What's the alternate? The alternate is to be enmeshed in an immobile madness, terminally. So we're in the position of Paleolithic men and women who have to learn that what we're hunting now is the biggest game of all, how to be real in our own lives. That's what we're after. We need that to live. That's our nutrition. That's our clothing, our source of clothing. It's the only way in which we can live. For Ernst, three years before, he did Paris Dreams, which has this beautiful self symbol in the sky above the city. Three years before that, he had done a painting that came completely out of the despair, and he called it North Pole. A completely dark black painting where only the etched skylights, you can barely see the self symbol enmeshed. It's like the negative print, <laughs> so that the painting Paris Dreams was like the print out of this negative. This negative came in 1922. This negative came at a time when the only way in which his questing, which his, his need to whitewater raft in the stream of consciousness was limited to making rubbings of nature and letting those rubbings of nature indicate to him some kind of insight into a further reality that was not there in nature. In fact, he collected 34 of his rubbings together and had them published as a book called History Naturelle. You want to talk about nature. Okay, this is nature. This is the very structure of nature. I have rubbed, I have, in the frottage technique, I have made an impress of what nature is. But it certainly doesn't stay there for me, because I can juxtapose disparate natural things and come up with relationalities with a work of art which was never there in nature and never could have been there in nature. That art is transcendent of, it's abstract from, it is totally different, other than alien to the entire cycle of integrative nature. So that art, in some realistic, sober way, is never a representation of something else. It's always itself presenting. But the whole idea that art as a representation is faulty to the nth degree all along. A telephone book full of faults with that premise, with that conclusion. Now, somebody like a Max Ernst didn't ask it, but a Kandinsky certainly did. He was very intellectual. Where does this idea come from? 
Who in the hell told us that art is representational of reality? And one comes and finds, ah, it appeared in a book. <laughs> you know, I can't use the Hollywood language. Aristotle, the principle, the doctrine of mimesis. That art is a mime of something else. Whereas this is not true at all. Because if you look at Plato, nowhere does he have that mimetic quality. In Pythagoras, there is a respect for the mystical instantness that really is there for the art. But in Aristotle, one finds this this captivating, almost this hypnotic sway that somehow art is a representation of something which is there in nature and is real in nature. Where is it real in nature? Where is nature ever real? Always emergent, physis. And this emergence has to it not some kind of a hodgepodgeness. It doesn't just the the term the term of mistaking the hodgepodge for nature has a really beautiful word in Sanskrit. It's called in Sanskrit papancha. Papancha means cloud making, clouds of dust, not clouds like beautiful white clouds of the atmosphere, but clouds of dust. When you, when you scuff the dust in those clouds of dust, papancha, the mind that keeps scuffing over the static dead frames of reference just raises dust, that's all. Doesn't raise vision, just dust. This papancha. So that the whole purpose of Dhyana in Sanskrit, concentration, meditation, is all made to let the dust settle. Don't get busy trying to see forms in the dust, just let it settle. And when the dust settles, when it all settles, one can see that there is a horizon of dust above which is a non-dust perspective. So one finds in Marx Ernst constantly this, this theme of the clear circle above the horizon. Even in his earliest painting, when he was still a teenager, one finds this motif, and later on in Marx Ernst, one finds it developed to quite an extraordinary degree. There is in Ernst, in his work, if I can find it here, a work done the following year called The Wheel of the Sun, 1926. For the first time, one finds this horizon below, the black negative landscape with all the scraped confusion squiggles. But above that rises this kind of a circularity, which has a circular resonance. And if one looks closely at this, the circle of the sun has the texture of a hose because he used a circular hose which impressed the very canvas on it. So it had the kind of impressed like the scales of a snake, like a sun snake that was completely circular. So by 1926, the wheel of the sun was able to present something which when one looks at this, even in a photograph, when one looks at this work in its actuality, it's like looking at a Paleolithic work of art. It evokes on such a fundamental level that even the rocks are surprised at what is disclosed. The earth itself is shocked at what is true about its fundamental nature. Not about its nature in terms of the illusory things made with the molecules of minerals and the 
ways in which plants and animals form some kind of a tapestry of scintillating gestalts, but that down belief in, on the subatomic level, nature has a truth about it which was not discernible on the molecular, on the mineral, on the plant, on the animal, on the fantasy level. That all of that was certainly true as long as it happened, but it was not permanently, ultimately true. That all of that could be dissolved and brought back to the subatomic level, and there one finds a complete scintillating world, quite different. Quite different from the deception, but quite affine to our true spiritual person. Our spiritual person is like subatomic nuclear physics. And why shouldn't it be? We have a great objective correlative. The way in which we are is the way in which the cosmos really is. There's that kind of an alignment. So the alignment has something to do not with man looking to order himself by the way in which he interprets the props of a scenario, but it has something to do with aligning the stones and the stars and putting himself midway. That when the stones and the stars are aligned with man's midway alignment, some great diagonal of truth is drawn in reality. And one finds that there is a great difference in the capacity of men and women. Only a few men and women were wise as long as they put their transformational art in the caves under the earth. But as soon as they learned to take the caves out of the earth, to turn the earth inside out and put the caves on the surface so that you had megalithic alignments like a Stonehenge, right away the art became cosmic. And one finds that one can make alignments that sing with the way in which the sun and the moon choreograph themselves forever with the way in which whole star patterns rise and set and rise again. That one can make a correlation that is truthful. That while the stream of consciousness is certainly moving along, it nevertheless is a stream that's going somewhere. It has a purpose. Its purpose is not just in some kind of dazzling ongoingness, but it goes somewhere. Where does it go? As Melville says in Moby Dix, if you follow water long enough, eventually you find the sea. All the streams of consciousness flow into the cosmos, this great ocean of the real. All the streams of the individual spirit flow into heaven. Why else would it be real? On what other basis would one have alignment? And so on this level in the 1920s, some of the greatest artists of the 20th century rediscovered what primordial men and women had discovered for themselves. That's why early modern art has such an affinity with archaic art. The artists began to go back and, and look at the art of primitive man the art of uncivilized, uncultured people, because they found there the fragments, the shards of an ancient wisdom. Not old in the sense of learning from books 2,000 years old, but ancient in the sense of going back hundreds of thousands of years, of being aligned with millions of years, of having that kind of a certainty. The certainty was no longer in a stasis of habitual placement, but the certainty was in the choreographed relationalities that always danced in this way. So that by the late 1920s, there were great 
artists and great appreciators of those artists in the 20th century who were learning to dance to the chore choreography of a differential spirit. And just about that time, is if the demons would not give up peacefully, one finds a sea change in the whole world. One finds a kind of a desperation that creeps in, and by the early 1930s, the world in its madness gels into some kind of final madness, some kind of prison of global insanity. And out of this, Max Ernst, for the very first time, begins finding in his paintings, instead of a concern with the circles in the sky and the landscape horizons that had become great, interesting forests, the forests become a jungle which consumes the self-symbol in the sky, pulls it down till one begins to find kinds of paintings. This one is called Bird in a Cage in a Black Forest. The date, 1927. By 1933, what emerges out of the forest, now turned into a jungle, is an abstract city, a city that stretches so far that it completely engulfs the entire painting. And one of the most famous paintings of that time, I'm not sure if I can find it on the spur of the moment, it's called The Entire City. Nineteen thirty five. The entire city. In the next five years, a acid rain of perception will dissolve this entire city and jungle into a ruin. And Ernst's great apocalyptic painting of 1940 is entitled Europe After the Rain. In which all the forms of the city and the jungle are completely dissolved by an inner acid rain that leaves an etched madness in place of what was a civilization. It was at this period, it was at this time it was for this discovery that Ernst packed up and he left. He left Europe. He went to New York such a pell-mell way that he had difficulty coming into the country. People had to vouch for him. One of the people who began to be friendly to him, a young woman, Dorothea Tanning, came involved with Ernst, and he finally decided to even leave New York City, and he went with Dorothea to her land in Sedona, Arizona. And there in Sedona, Arizona, Ernst found a landscape that was truly Paleolithic, the northern Arizona Red Rock Desert was like that old Paleolithic art landscape brought up to the surface again that the dissolving Europe after the rain had never been there. And Ernst's art began to transform. He began to see a vision of possibilities that could only be hinted at in some of his earlier paintings. One finally found the ability. There are two paintings. One is called Inspired Hill. The one below is called The 20th Century began to make these fantastic abstract canvases, seething with color, seething with forms and possibilities. And Ernst became probably the greatest living artist on the planet in these years. Photographs don't do it any justice whatsoever. He completely changed the way in which 
modern art was conceivable. I'll try to bring some slides next week, or if we don't get a chance to show them here when we take our sculptures up to our house, we'll show some slides there of Ernst's late works. The late works of Max Ernst, like the late works of Kandinsky, show a tremendous joyful vision of new realms of possibility that as the stream of consciousness of individual spirits join, just as in nature where the streams join and one finds eventually mighty rivers, in the transcendental realm of differential conscious time space, when individual streams of consciousness join together, one finds whole rivers of consciousness of community. And he saw that what was coming in the very near future was a complete transformation of the geography of human life. Because when one has Mississippi rivers or Amazon rivers of communities of streams of consciousness, one finds a completely new landscape that men and women have emerged out of the deceptive world of some impossible world that never was into a relational gestalt possibility that always is open and inviting. Conscious time space is as we live it. And when we live it in vast communities of the spirit, the whole landscape changes those rivers very quickly because they have amassed their dynamic flow into the cosmos quite openly. The cosmos receives them, having received such rivers of light because it itself is made of them. More next week. Mm -hmm.